It's Wednesday, July 27 in the headlines. Planned water lock-offs for corporate area. Updates for Jamaica's Diamond Jubilee celebration. Regionally, St. Lucia launches e-passports. And in sports, a 47-member team for Commonwealth Games. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gill. The National Water Commission, NWC, has decided to reduce nighttime production levels. This will result in some customers experiencing low water pressure or no water. This took effect on Tuesday with the shut-off time being 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. The NWC says the Mona and Constant Spring supply facilities are experiencing reduced production levels due to a decline in inflows from river sources. NWC's corporate communication manager, Andrew Cannon, explains. We are imploring our customers to please conserve as best as they can at this time, because although it is expected that there is going to be some rains in September and October, we don't know if, in fact, we will get those rains and we don't know the volume of the rainfall. Either way, what customers should be aware of is the output or the demand for water vis-a-vis -vis the input from the rains what do i mean we could be getting showers yes in terms of sprinkling here and there but we have to bear in mind that there is also an output component whereby there is a large demand for the commodity that has to be met. Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports, Olivia Grange, provided Parliament with upcoming plans for the Diamond Jubilee in the sitting of the House of Representatives on Tuesday afternoon. Gabriel Thompson has the details. Minister of Gender, Culture, Youth and Sports, Olivia Grange, outlined the significance of the more than half a decade celebrations held by the country. It is our tradition to have a significant commemoration of our independence milestone every five years. The purpose of these five yearly commemorations is twofold. On one hand, we reflect and do a report, a report card on our progress as a country. We see to what extent our goals were met, and on the other hand, we use our celebration to set goals for the next five years while finding opportunities to engage and motivate our people towards achieving our national objectives. Minister Grange then delved into the scheduled activities set to begin this week. Starting tomorrow with the Governor General's Independence Reception at King's House, which will bring Diplomats here in Jamaica, leaders of industry, and some of our political representatives and civil society leaders to a reception which is being hosted by the Governor General. And at that reception, there will be performances that will include Della Manley, Dwight Richards, and Ken Booth. But it's not only a reception and entertainment. There will be an exhibition curated by the Institute of Jamaica, dubbed Birth of a Nation, Jamaica in 1962. In addition to this, the Diamond Jubilee Thanksgiving service will close off the month on July 31. We have been taught that in all things we must give thanks. The Jamaica 60th National Thanksgiving Service will be held on Sunday, July 31 at Boulevard Baptist Church beginning at 9.30 a.m. And participating in the national service will be the Prime Minister of Jamaica and the leader of the opposition. She says this year's Emancipation Day will see the reintroduction of a tradition that has been long-standing in the island's history. At 10 o'clock on Emancipation Day, we welcome back the Independence Float and Street Parade. The last time was in 2018. 
The Float and Street Parade will start at the Randy Williams Entertainment Center on Hope Road, goes to Halfway Tree, then to Oxford Road, then to Tom Redcomb, and end up in the National Stadium car park. The Float and Street Parade will include a number of our Jamaican sound systems, including Stone Love, Renaissance, and Rough Cut. We will have eight exciting floats, seven music trucks, seven costume groups, effigies, John Canoe, youth groups, over 1,000 participants. And in fact, we will have the JCF participating as well. Jamaica's 60th Independence Anniversary year-long celebrations are being observed under the theme Reigniting a Nation for Greatness. Preparation for Census 2022 is now in high gear. 7,525 persons have been recruited as census takers. They are being trained and they will begin their job come September. Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, gave an update on the census in Parliament on Tuesday. The Finance and Public Service Minister says so far, two rounds of census taker training have been conducted in nine parishes. The third round of training begun, began yesterday, Monday, July 25th, and will end on August 9th. Census takers are being trained in person and online and are supported by an online training platform. He says the census will last for three months. I'm also pleased to remind this House that the Census Day will be on September 12, 2022. That's the day of record for the Census this year. And the data collection exercise will start thereafter and conclude on the 31st of December 2022. Minister Clark says this national exercise must be supported by all, as each and every person living in Jamaica must be counted. The census is more than just a count of the population. It also captures information on the housing stock in the country, on key social and demographic information that informs policy. It helps us to determine where to put our schools, where to put our clinics, and where to locate other government services. Jamaica has been conducting national censuses since 1844. In keeping with international standards and best practices, censuses are conducted every 10 years. The last census in Jamaica was conducted in 2011. Given the COVID-19 pandemic, this round of census had to be delayed by a year. Human trafficking is the recruitment Transportation, transfer, harboring or receipt of people through force, fraud or deception with the aim of exploiting them for profit. In Jamaica, majority of victims are poor Jamaican women and girls and increasingly boys who are trafficked from rural to urban and tourist areas for commercial sexual exploitation. In an effort to increase public awareness, the National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons will be hosting a series of activities during Trafficking in Persons Week from July 24 to July 30. We have more in this report from Raquel Robinson. Manager of the Trafficking in Persons Secretariat in the Ministry of National Security, Audrey Budai, outlined the plans for the week ahead. For this week and this year, we have identified that what we will do is a number of public relations, public activities, public education, public information, and community contact to try to raise the awareness. Director of Children and Family Programs at Child Protection and Family Service Agency, Warren Thompson, outlined the agency's responsibility and roles in the fight against human trafficking. Our role in the task force um, or in the trafficking response was significantly amplified in 2018 when the um, U.S. government and Jamaica signed the U.S. Jamaica Child Protection Compact, which focuses on strengthening the response of the government of Jamaica 
to the issue of child trafficking in particular. Under this agreement, we received technical support and we have had to, to do a number of internal things to strengthen our response. He says their agency is also reassessing its role in case management in trafficking. We um, are looking at the CPFC's role in providing case management um, for child victims of trafficking all the way through from victim identification through to um, reintegration into the community or into their families. So we're doing a number of things. Um, we're looking at um, placement options and one of the things that we developed internal at the CPFC, um, of course with some technical support. The 30th of July is acknowledged as World's Day Against Trafficking in Persons. In 2013, the UN General Assembly designated July 30 as the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons and declared that such a day was necessary to raise awareness of the situation of victims of human trafficking and for the promotion and protection of their rights. Reporting for PBCJ News, I'm Raquel Robinson. Director of the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne, is in Jamaica on an official visit. The Pan American Health Organization works with countries of the Americas to improve the health and quality of life of their populations. Dr. Etienne's leadership has been instrumental in the region's response to significant public health threats, including Zika, Chick V, and the current COVID-19 pandemic. I, I wish to thank the government of Jamaica for inviting me to this visit. It is an official visit where I will have discussions with the, um, the minister and his team from the Ministry of Health. We will also visit the University of the West Indies and have some discussions there. I will have the opportunity to visit uh, one of your primary health care centers and to have discussions around some of the lessons that we've learned um, with the COVID pandemic. And, um, and certainly we'll have some time to, uh, to be with your healthcare workers as we celebrate their heroism. Recent cooperation with PAHO includes regional training in laboratory detection and diagnosis of the viral condition arranged by the National Public Health Lab in collaboration with PAHO. The workshop on laboratory detection on the diagnosis of monkeypox virus held recently involved 10 participants from four Caribbean countries, Jamaica, Bahamas, Guyana and Suriname. PAHO's strategic health priorities for Jamaica are outlined in the organization's country cooperation strategy. They include the resilience of health systems strengthened within the framework of universal health an inclusive healthy lifestyle approach to address the health needs of the population advanced, an integrated approach to address the social and economic determinants of health and health equity in support of sustainable development promoted, the environment determinants addressed to build resilient communities. In the business report, Jamaicans are being reminded that consumption taxes are due. We have more in that story, plus your regular market updates. Dinita Rodney is at the business desk. Tax Administration Jamaica TAJ is reminding business persons that consumption taxes for the month of June are due on Friday, July 29, 2022 to include GCT, SCT, TCT and GART. This is in keeping with the requirements for these taxpayers to make their monthly consumption tax returns and payments on the last working day of the month after the end of the taxable period. Note that consumption taxes filed and paid after the last working day of the month will be considered late and the necessary penalties and interest charges applied. For online payments or for more information, you can visit their website at www.jamaicatax.gov.jm. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, July 26, the US dollar sold for an average of $154.04. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $118.78. The pound sterling traded for $184.92. And the euro sold for an average of $158.60. 
The following reflects the movement of the GSE indices in Tuesday's trading session. The GSE index advanced by 2,441 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index declined by 145 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index declined by 3,589 points to close at over 300,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 3,348 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 109 stocks of which 59 advanced, 34 declined and 16 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference and Access Financial Services Limited. Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, and Dollar Financial Services Limited saw a decline in their stocks. 1834 Investments Limited, Blue Power Group Limited, and Community and Workers of Jamaica's TCU Deferred Share traded firm. The following companies represent overall volume leaders. JFP Limited with over 3 million units, Jamaica Boilers Group, and Dollar Financial Services Limited with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Clico Investment Fund was the only active security posting a volume of over 7,000 shares. Zero securities were traded on the Barbados Stock Exchange. In regional news, many Barbadians can expect to see their bills increase by about $12 if the Barbados Light and Power Company is successful in its request for a rate increase. BLNP Manager of Regulatory Affairs, Adrian Carter, outlined the possible adjustments. For the typical residential customer, the rates we propose will result in about a $12 increase in their electricity bill. Our customers that consume under 150 kilowatt hours in a month. Now these customers represent about 35% of our customer base or just over 40,000 customers. Their bill increase is not expected to be more than $6 after the rates are put in place. In market data for oil, oil prices rose as a report of lower inventories in the United States and cut in Russian gas flows to Europe offset concern about weaker demand and a looming U.S. rate interest hike. Brent crude rose $1.04 to $105.44 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate crude gained $1.16 to $96.14. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, Barbadians have just over two months to get rid of two types of British currency in their possession. Come September 30, the 20 and 50 pound notes will no longer be legal tender. Head of the Political and Communications Department at the British High Commission in Barbados, Tom Hines, says the Bank of England is moving from paper notes to polymer. And we're taking out of circulation these um, older paper 20 pound and 50 pound notes. And that means that if you go to the UK with an old uh, 20 pound note and you go to a shop after the 30th of September, they will not accept it. So I would say to Barbadians, if you are in the UK before uh, uh, September the 30th, then get rid of that money either by depositing in a bank account or, or spending it. In Trinidad and Tobago, the airport authority, in collaboration with the European Union and several government ministries, participated in the installation of a 0.5 megawatt solar park at the Piarco International Airport. The project, being funded through a TT $12 million grant from the European Union, is expected to reduce the airport's carbon footprint when completed and will contribute to the airport's current annual electrical consumption. Minister of Energy Stuart Young believes the project is a step in the right direction, adding that another similar project is expected soon. It is the start of what we hope to get done as a government in Trinidad and Tobago, which is more of a move towards renewables, replacing the use of natural gas for electricity generation. It is also significant that this, is, this has been done based on EU fund funding and via grants and it's not financing so we're happy for that partnership and it fits into what we all need to do globally to try and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions.
Meanwhile, European Ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago, Peter Cavendish, believes the project will benefit this country to reduce its carbon emissions by 15% by the year 2030. But the uh, figure is already a very significant contribution. We're talking about 3.5% upwards of the energy consumption of the airport. And that is not insignificant. And it, it is this country is taking steps towards meeting its nationally determined contribution. In St. Lucia, government has launched an e-passport for citizens with stakeholders discussing the impact of the transition. After much dialogue on the path to travel documentation, St. Lucians will now gain access to national borders with a newly implemented e-passport system. Described as a step toward the future, the transition will see the replacement of existing passports with documents hoped to reduce the illegal use of national identifying documentation. Issuing welcome remarks, Police Commissioner Milton Daisy affirmed that the transition is hoped to significantly impact the free movement of people. The e-passport is said to be the next generation of travel documents and presents several advantages to holders. The new system promises increased security features to include protection against identity fraud through the use of increased biometric features and many more unique means of ensuring authenticity. The transition to this system will undoubtedly allow St. Lucia to enhance its border management efforts in keeping with recommendations by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. According to DAISY, the new passports are expected to offer a higher level of protection for travel documents and transactions conducted with them. The police commissioner detailed observations made surrounding regional and international transitions to e-passports and their ability to ensure advancement in efforts to maintain secure borders. In 2007, a transition to machine-readable passports marked the commencement of the evolutionary process for travel documents used by nationals. According to immigration expert Lucius Lake, today's launch saw the conclusion of efforts which commenced even then. United Nations humanitarian agencies have started delivering aid directly to people in Haiti following a recent spike in violence between viral gangs that has fueled a worsening crisis across the capital, Port-au-Prince. The UN says vulnerable inhabitants in City Solil, as well as those in other neighborhoods of Port-au-Prince, have received items such as hygiene and baby supplies, plastic sheeting, jerry cans for water, blankets, solar lamps, and repair items for houses from the UN's International Organization for Migration. UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, also delivered over 300,000 liters of drinking water, enough for 20,000 people for two days. UNICEF also provided 300 hygiene kits and assisted 780 children with psychosocial support. The UN says the World Food Program also distributed food including rice, beans and oil which can feed 15,000 for a week. In sports, the Jamaica Athletics Administration has named a 47-member team of athletes to participate in the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, set to begin on Tuesday, August 2. Jamaica's team to the Commonwealth Games includes Akila Smith, Akeem Bloomfield, Daniel Williams, Daniel Thomas Dodd, Elaine Thompson Herrer, Frederick Dakers, Hansel Parchment, Jahil Hyde, Javon Francis, Javon Powell, Cadrian Goldson, Lamara Diston, Nigel Ellis, Odane Richards, Orlando Bennett, Rashid Broadbell, Rashid Dwyer, Sharika Jackson, Sheehan Salmon, Stephanie Ann McPherson, Tiffany James, and Travis Michael, among others. The Commonwealth Games Federation announced on Monday that Trinidad and Tobago will host the 2023 Commonwealth Youth Games. The announcement was made at the Commonwealth Games Federation General Assembly in Birmingham. The decision comes after Trinidad and Tobago were initially awarded the 2021 Commonwealth Youth Games in June 2019, but that event was postponed due to the impact of the pandemic on the international sporting calendar. 
Following the postponement, the CGF reviewed the best alternative options and the timeframes for staging the event in the future. The CGF then entered close dialogue with Trinidad and Tobago Commonwealth Games Association and the government of Trinidad and Tobago before an agreement was signed at the CGF General Assembly. Minister of Sport and Community Development Shamfa Kacho said, We are delighted and committed that we are able to stage the Commonwealth Youth Games next year. Following the pandemic, this event will provide a fantastic boost for our country and provide amazing opportunities for young athletes across the Commonwealth to compete. We are proud to be staging such a prestigious sporting competition. The event was last held in the Bahamas in the year 2017. The Antigua and Barbuda Football Association's Knockout Cup will kickstart the official 2022-2023 season. Terry Andrews has the lineup. The first round of the knockout competition will see first and second division clubs compete. At the recently held draw, it was announced Boland's FC will oppose Tamu FC, Potter's Tigers and Bethesda Christian Hill will battle, and Garden Stars will take on Earthquake FC. Young Lions will play Young Warriors, West Ham FC will tackle Wings FC, JSC Progressors will oppose Attacking Saints, and Green City FC and Belmont FC will go head-to-head. -head. Other first-round matches, Police vs. Seaview Farm, John Hughes vs. Glanvilles, Bendels vs. Pears FC, and Fort Road FC vs. Herbert's FC are scheduled. Lion Hill vs. Jennings United, Hoff Uprising vs. Master Ballers FC, Real Blizzard vs. Abaya, and English Harbour FC vs. Blackburn Palace round out the fixtures. Mahaiko FC will receive a bye. ABFA's technical director, Sobi Gomes, says the tournament will be an exciting one. What is going to be a very exciting um, games of knockout competition to kickstart our football season here in Antigua. The champion team will take home 50,000 EC dollars. First runner-up, will take home 20,000, third, second runner-up will take home 10,000, and the third runner-up will take home 5,000 cash prize. The Knockout Cup is sponsored by Jomo Caribbean and Cool and Smooth. And that's the news on PBCJ. Follow us on all our social media pages at PBC Jamaica. Remember, we are the People's Station.